I'm Josh Young, and I'm going to be talking about preparing your practice for a successful and smooth transition to meaningful use medical records. I'm not going to be talking about any particular vendor. This is going to be a, a generic talk, uh, both in the sense of not discussing particular software packages, but also in the sense that this talk is not even applicable to only ophthalmology, but but to other medical specialties that office have, that also have office-based practices. Okay, so it may feel like the end of the world is is nigh um, with uh, the deadlines coming up for transition to meaningful use medical records, and, and indeed, it, it's a it's a st- it's a steep cliff for us to uh, climb. Um, but uh, w- what I'm going to be talking about is is not what's wrong with meaningful use, but how to minimize the discomfort in making the transition to that sort of package. Everything that I discuss is uh, going to be linked at i.vg. There's no .com. It's just i.vg, uh, which is my practice's website. And I'll show you later on uh, how to get to the particular part of the uh, website that has got this content in it. Okay, before we even get started talking about a transition to medical records, we we need to talk about what to do with your existing 15,000 pa- um, paper patient charts. And 15,000 is a a, a pretty reasonable number for a modest-sized practice that's been around for some time. You're you're not going to move those 15,000 charts to a digital format uh, all in one fell swoop. We're uh, going to do this in a piecemeal fashion. And we're, in fact, going to begin this transition before you've even picked out your particular medical record system. Fortunately, there's a lingua franca. There's a, a common platform that all medical record systems that I've seen, I'm sure all medical record systems that exist, can import. And that is PDF. This is a format that was introduced by Adobe in 1991, made free in 1993, and became an open standard in 2008, which is why a, a, every package that I've seen is capable of importing PDF scanned paper charts. So how are we going to go about scanning them? This is what I want you to do in terms of the flow of uh, the, 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 the sort of cycle that the patient's chart is going to, to make. And this is something that you're not going to wait for when you've picked out a medical record system. This is something that I'm going to want you to start this week. So when a patient comes to your office, just as is done now normally, the patient's chart gets pulled. You're going to take the the exam note that you normally use. Uh, this is an example of uh, mine, and you'll put it in the front of the chart. I, I, I know that this sounds silly, but we're, we're going to contrast this with what you're going to do when a patient comes in for a subsequent visit. You'll see the patient in your exam lane, you'll make the notes in the in the chart the way that you normally do. You're going to uh, add uh, the note for today's exam to the existing patient's chart, and then you're going to have your front desk or your back desk scan it. Now, I've used many scanners, including $1,000 standalone scanners, and I'll tell you, I think that the multifunction printers like this brother printer that I'm showing you here uh, which costs much less than a standalone scanner does, does a perfectly fine job. You're going to be scanning them at 300 dots per inch, black and white. Not grayscale, not color. I know you, you've made some beautiful color drawings, and they're all going to wind up as sort of black and white line art, but that's fine. You're not going to miss them, I promise you. Now, I've told you to kind of cut corners on the cost for the scanner. I'm going to tell you exactly the opposite with the shredder. You're going to buy an expensive shredder. I'd like you not to spend less than about $1,000 for the shredder. And I can say this from experience, having burnt out two $500 shredders. If you feel uncomfortable with the idea of shredding your existing patient's charts and you want to hold on to the paper charts for a while until you're more comfortable, that is perfectly fine. This is what I need you to do. I need you to buy some big blue dot stickers or red dot sticker staples sells these. And next to the tab on the patient's chart that has the initials of the patient's name or whatever little tab system you use, you're going to put a big blue dot or a big red dot right there. 
as an indication to you that the contents of this chart has been scanned because it is vitally important for you going forward to be able to instantly recognize which charts have been scanned and which have not. And the reason is this. This is what happens when you see a patient for a follow-up exam. You're not going to pull the uh, patient's paper chart. You'll access the PDF on screen. And you have uh, your blank exam note. You're going to go to the exam room with that note. You'll see the patient. You'll fill it out. And that single sheet will get scanned in your scanner and then shredded, or if you want, put in the uh, chart. And this is going to be the uh, case with all of your charts that have blue dots, all of the charts that have been previously scanned. What are we going to do now, however, that we have got two PDF charts for the same patient? We have one PDF scan that's the original patient's chart and another single-page PDF scan that represents the encounter from today. Or maybe it's two pages, but at any rate, we've got two separate files. How are we going to combine them into one PDF? Well, I told you that I was not going to make software recommendations, but that's not entirely true. I am going to recommend a particular document management package. Now, this is not a medical records package, although I'll represent to you that this is what I used for my medical records for about 10 years. It, it was easy. It was wonderful. Unfortunately, it did not meet uh, meaningful use criteria. We're going to use a package called Paperport. Paperport is a, a, a PDF document management uh, piece of software. Uh, and um, this is an example from the, the, the Paperport website. And you see that there are multiple PDFs that we're viewing uh, in a folder uh, that you see to the left. These are not patient's charts. This, as I said, comes from the, the, the Paperport website. Uh, I'm going to show you um, what my website looks like. Uh, my, excuse me, my paper port looks like, uh, which is this. So um, we have on the left side uh, folders with the different patient's charts. I'm going to click an F. I have got four subfolders in each of my letters. I changed the names to fictitious. If you look carefully, you'll see it's spelled wrong. I'm taking the single page from today's exam, and I'm dragging it over the existing chart for that patient. And you see that it just adds it as the top page to the PDF. It just adds it right into the existing PDF. And this is a very easy way to handle uh, PDF files and patients' charts. And this is something that you're going to start doing right now in preparation for incorporation of these charts into whatever medical record system you decide to, to go with. But get on with some of this, this labor now. It's going to save you time later on. And what does this fantastic piece of software cost? Uh, the day that I prepared this, this lecture, Amazon had it for $38. What a bargain. Okay, so let's talk about the meat of this talk, which is uh, preparing uh, for a transition to a, a successful and smooth transition to meaningful use medical records. There are uh, a bunch of different ways that we can split up medical record packages. Uh, one way is to split them up into ophthalmology-specific EMRs and generic EMRs with ophthalmology templates. To my mind, ophthalmology-specific EMRs and a generic EMR with a good ophthalmology template are equivalent. I don't really see any advantage to one over the the other. Granted, the uh, ophthalmology-specific EMRs were built from the ground up for ophthalmology, I found that they're sufficiently quirky that they demand customization for ophthalmology practices the same way that a generic EMR with an ophthalmology template would. I don't think that this should play such a significant role in choosing one package over the other. One thing that I think matters much more is the user interface. There are, uh, there are EMR packages that are entirely menu-driven that involve a lot of clicking, uh, like one that I'm showing you here, where the slit lamp exam and acuity and all sorts of uh, things are, um, have to be chosen in the context of drop-down menus. I find for myself that this is cumbersome, but maybe you'll find it easier uh, than typing, in which case you'd want to consider a package like this. I have read in um, in anecdotes related to to studies, uh, one 
ophthalmologist saying, excuse me, one physician saying that he was concerned that it would be more likely that he would uh, click something wrong, uh, click on the uh, wrong choice, than to type in something wrong. This is an example of a, a medical record system that involves lots of typing. This is more like a kind of a pre-populated Word document where uh, a slit lamp exam might be pre-populated with, with normal findings and that you go in and that you, 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 you type in and edit the, uh, those findings that were not normal or you know, cup to disc ratio or pressures or things like, like this. So this is a system that involves more typing. Uh, there's going to be some clicking when we deal with the, the pharmacology end of it, but the exam encounter end is uh, very, very much text-based here. And then, of course, there are some packages uh, that are hybrids that uh, are, a, are a little bit of both, a little clicking and a little bit of typing. I'm not going to really talk about billing here. That's not really what this, what, what's in the scope of this lecture. I, I, I will make one request, which is this. There are a lot of EMR packages that have integrated billing, an integrated billing option. I have no opinion about whether to use these or not, but I would ask that whatever you do, that you please not sign on to the integrated billing at the same time that you're making your transition to the medical record system. It's too much to try to make both of those transitions at the same time. It's simply too stressful. Do one and then several months later you can do the other. Okay, now this is something that really does matter. There are two architectural models for EMR packages, those that are cloud-based and those that are client-server. So we're gonna spend a little time talking about both. When you think of client-server, this is the traditional sort of network that you think of when you think of a, a computer network, where there's one computer, one big computer, although obviously it doesn't have to be physically big, that stores all the files, that runs the, the sort of central software um, that all of the other computers uh, pass data to and from, and we call this the, the, the server. The server is connected to a router. This is something that splits the computer signal up uh, amongst the computers in the individual exam lanes, and uh, many routers have wireless functions uh, that let you uh, walk around with a, with a laptop or a tablet or something else. Okay, the alternative is a cloud system, and I'm showing you part of a cloud here. This is identical to what I showed you before with a router uh, sending data to and uh, from each of the computers in the exam room and the connection to the wireless laptop or tablet, or whatever. But rather than connecting to a server, it's connecting to the through the internet to a whole bunch of redundant servers in your vendor's server center. And these servers may be distributed over different centers and over different spaces, but they work together, and that's why we call them a cloud. Uh, with cloud systems, since your office is accessing the servers through the internet, it's very easy then for satellite offices to also get onto the same, your same medical record system if you've got more than one place. Um, because there need not be any physical connection to a server that you own, it is uh, a connection through the internet to the cloud. Also, it makes it very easy to uh, connect to your medical record system from home uh, or from the road. Okay, when we talk about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, cloud versus client server, one thing that I want to touch on that's often glossed over but it is a really big deal uh, has to do with data and what I call data security and data liability. According to HIPAA, you are required to implement controls to ensure the physical security of your systems to prevent people from logging into your network and looking at patient data or you know, walking into your office and logging on to one of your, your computers and looking at, 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 at patient data or sitting in your waiting room and getting onto your office Wi-Fi and looking at patient data. Data liability refers to the fact that you need, you're, you're obligated to establish a data disaster recovery and backup plan 
so that if your office is flooded, if there's a fire, if the computer physically breaks, that you have some backup, some offsite backup uh, of your data, and you are in charge of that. The advantage of cloud-based systems are that the data security and the data liability are, for the most part, uh, the responsibility of the vendor and not of you. Certainly, the, the, the backup and the, the disaster planning, uh, all of these things are the responsibility of the vendor. The security, for the most part, too. I mean, there, there is no office server that can be logged onto from the outside because the server is not on your end, it's on their end. And these s systems require you to, to log on, and that takes a lot of the uh, office security burden off of your, your shoulders, too. Implementing a cloud-based system is, is simple, and implementing it for satellite offices is very simple, too, uh, because all that you really need is hardware that can get on, online on, onto the web. And similarly, the hardware requirements are very low. Uh, all that you need are computers that can run whatever sort of web browser uh, your vendor requires you to use. However, the bandwidth requirements are substantial. Now, as far as the hardware that I recommend, the, the first thing that always comes to everyone's mind is, I don't have much space in my exam lanes. I'm just going to get laptops. That's a bad move. You're going to be spending a lot of time working with the screen. You want as much real estate on the screen as you can. What I recommend is an all-in-one system where the computer is built into the monitor, but the monitor is substantial sized. Uh, the one that I show here is a 21-inch monitor. Believe me, you have room for a 21-inch monitor. This takes up very, very little desk space. This is uh, from healthit.gov, which is a useful resource. Uh, on its bandwidth recommendations for cloud-based systems. For a single doctor practice, they recommend four megabytes per, excuse me, four megabits per second. And keep in mind, this is not the numbers that when you get your internet at home and it says three megabytes per second, those are all download speeds. You need this to be symmetric. You need not only four megabytes download, but four megabytes upload. And it's the upload bandwidth that really is going to cost you money. We share our internet amongst four doctors, and we do have 10 me megabytes, excuse me, megabits per second, as is recommended for the uh, uh, small practice uh, down at the bottom of the slide. That 10 megabits per second upload and download costs us in New York City, which is a competitive market, $800 every month. So the bandwidth is not cheap and is a cost that you have to factor in when you're comparing costs of these systems. The advantages of client-server-based systems are data access. You're not having to uh, pass photographs and other large chunks of data back and forth through the, through the internet, so they tend to run faster. The reliability of the system, in a sense, is better, in the sense that you don't have to worry that losing internet service is going to prevent you from seeing patients' charts. But the reliability of a client base uh, of a client server based system is only as good as the reliability of your server. If your server goes down, then you don't have access to patients' charts. The bandwidth requirements are much less, much more comparable to what you might have at home. The hardware requirements are steeper, mainly because you need to purchase the server. So this is uh, from a non-ophthalmic, because again, I don't want to play favorites, uh, client-server-based system, uh, and the numbers here are uh, really pretty average. And what I did was I went to Dell.com and I priced this out for 15 users, their, their, their minimal system here, and I chose all the cheapest options at Dell. Uh, to see what a cheapest server would cost me that meet these, these criteria. I couldn't meet them all. There were some software things that they asked for that I didn't pri price in. So what I'm going to show you is a little bit underpriced. And the Dell system that I came up with uh, on discount was uh, about $7,300, regularly $10,000. The bottom line is this is going to cost you, you know, comparable to what a year of cloud bandwidth is 
going to cost you. Uh, the prices I think that you're going to see are going to be pretty comparable. Also, the client server based software tends to cost more than cloud based software does. Okay, I'm going to skip through uh, uh, the recommendations. You know, the hardware and software. Uh, for the clients, for the ones in your exam lane are uh, pretty easy and are not going to cost you very much money. Okay. Now, why none of this, these costs really matter? It's because the real costs are, uh, you're going to see, in productivity losses. The infrastructure costs here are costs of the, the, the uh, bandwidth or costs of the server, uh, costs of the IT people who are going to have to set things up for you. I'm going to skip that now. EMR mismatch refers to productivity loss resulting from the EMR's interface not matching your own personal practice style. And to some extent, it's inevitable that there's going to be some EMR mismatch. Okay, the real costs are productivity costs. And they come from three places. From training, from the amount of time between when your system goes live and when you return to your normal patient volume and ongoing productivity losses. We're going to talk about them all now. Training is important, and you do not want to skip it. Uh, training is the thing that's going to get you up to speed fastest and is ultimately going to save you money. But what I've tried to present here is a, a very modest training schedule for a very, a, a, a very modest sort of phase-in for a, a small single doctor practice. So this doctor sees 30 patients per uh, day, gets $100 uh, gross revenue per, per, per patient. That's $3,000 gross revenue per day. Takes three days completely off for, for training, which is you know, pretty average. Those three days off, that represents a $9,000 loss. Let's say that this doctor is a super doctor, and it only takes him six weeks to go from when he starts using the software package uh, in which a lot of vendors, and I think it's completely reasonable, advocate booking half your normal number of patients to where he's seeing his normal number of patients. Let's say that that time period, that phase in period, six weeks, it can certainly be longer. So I'm going to tell you that if we start out at half the volume and we end up at full volume, that the average uh, volume that 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 we're going to uh, see over that that six weeks is going to be seventy five percent of the patients that we normally see, or we're going to see a twenty five percent hit. Twenty five percent hit over thirty days at three thousand dollars per day is twenty two thousand five hundred dollars. And again, this is for a single doctor, small practice. Many of you are going to be in practices that are ten times this size. You can begin to see why the cost of the actual software doesn't really matter. It's a drop in the bucket. The big cost is the ongoing productivity losses, and I'm going to estimate them at $450 per day. And I'll share with you later on where this figure comes from, but that comes out to $112,500 per year. Putting this together, we see that in the first year, this very small practice is going to lose $144,000, and it's going to lose $112,000 each subsequent year. I'm going to show you how to minimize those costs. Yes. Perhaps it is the end of the world. The sources of productivity losses are fourfold. They're infrastructure bottlenecks, pre-exam bottlenecks, exam lane bottlenecks, and charting time. By infrastructure bottlenecks, what I mean are primarily issues dealing with the way that your software is running. If you're having problems with the server, uh, with the server isn't working, then you're not working. If you have cheaped out and gotten poor bandwidth, then you know if it takes a couple seconds between clicks, that adds up tremendously over the course of a of a week. These are issues that uh, you should be uh, prepared to spend money on. Okay, pre-exam bottlenecks. There are a million things that meaningful use requires you to record that you're not used to doing. It takes time to record these things. Um, and uh, you don't want to be the person doing them. Also, we as ophthalmologists are used to drawing things uh, on, on charts. I'm going to advocate not doing that. Now, the drawing shown here on the right, it does not refer to the patient on the, 
on the left. I'm not suggesting that they're the same patient. What I am showing is, is this. All of the medical record systems that you're going to, uh, to uh, see from your vendors are going to have very fancy drawing programs with you're going to be able to stamp this and rotate that and expand this. But drawing takes time, and that's the one thing that you don't have. In the past, when you were dealing with paper charts, it was very easy to draw, and it took longer to incorporate a photograph into that, that patient's charts. It's exactly the opposite when it comes to medical record systems, and it's a lot easier to photograph and upload that photo into the patient's chart than to draw things out, and dare I say, it's often more accurate, too. Okay, let's talk a about charting time and why your loss of productivity is going to lower the unemployment rate in this country. This is the thing that I think that I'm going to have the hardest time convincing most of you of. It is that there is no practice that is too small to benefit from hiring scribes. Let's do some math. Let's say that uh, you really take to your medical record system. It only takes you an extra three minutes to document on this, this complicated chart with the clicking and the, the medications and all of this sort of stuff per patient. Three extra minutes per patient at 30 patients per day is 90 minutes, 90 extra minutes of your time. And let's say that your time is only worth $300 an hour, and I hear you shout, no, my time's worth much more. Fine. But if it were only worth $300 per hour, that's a loss of $450 per day. And I will represent to you that there is no tech that's going to cost you $450 per day. So in addition to doing the PDFing of charts that I told you you're going to do right away, you're also going to start putting out ads for a scribe. That whole huge meaningful use list that, that, I, that I showed you, a lot of those, those things are going to be done by the techs in their workup of the patient before you actually see them. If you're a big enough practice with a lot of techs, then you may have to actually hire more people, uh, more techs, just to deal with uh, these meaningful use questionnaires. The last thing is, is that um, I, I, you, you're, you're going to see in these medical record systems patient portals uh, places on the web where the patient can access some of their demographic data and all of this sort of stuff. And you're going to think, okay, this, this is bells and whistles. It doesn't really matter. And I don't really care about it. And that's what I thought too, but I was wrong. Keep in mind, you don't pay for patient labor. So you want to leverage it. You want to shift as much of the burden, as much of the labor onto the patient uh, as you can. And you say, well, the, 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 the well, let, let me show you what I mean. This is uh, my uh, practice's website. We're going to click on patient portal. We're going to click on go to the clinical portal. And now we're into the EMR system. We're, really, we're actually off of my website. And the patient is going to register and fill things out here. And you say, but listen, I, I already have a website that has got forms for the patients to, to fill out. And they never print them out. They never fill them out. And you're absolutely right. So what we did was we bought a couple of Chromebooks, look, $199. This is basically a laptop-shaped web browser, and we have them in the waiting room, and when a patient comes in, we hand the patient a Chromebook, and we say, go to town. You know, fill out uh, these, these silly, meaningful use things. Of course, we don't call them that. Um, and uh, this way, there's that much less for the techs to do. Okay, last thing, how to demo an EMR. There is a pricing worksheet from the NLC that I linked to at i.vg. I'm not going to talk about that here. This is what I want you to do. I want you to bring three charts with you. I want you to bring a chart of a patient whom you've seen for the first time, a chart of a patient who's an established patient but you have not seen for a, for a while, so the exam is somewhat more complex. And I want you to bring a chart of a glaucoma follow-up, you know, five minute in and out. And I want you to ask the vendor to enter those charts into his system. And I want you to see how many menu steps there are and how long it takes the vendor, who's obviously very well versed with his own package, to, to enter those charts. Because 
in the end, you're not interested in all the features that the EMR system has. You're interested in how smoothly you can work with it so that you can spend more time with your patient and less on the screen and then be able to move on to the next patient. And then the last thing is that your system probably has to integrate with the HIE for your medical center. And the medical center may have a list of vendors from which you can choose uh, that will immediately narrow down your choices. Mine certainly did. We had a list of, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 vendors. We couldn't look beyond that list because they didn't have HIE integration with our system. So once more, i.vg, and what you want to go is uh, to Physician Resources, and you can click on Making a Smooth Transition to Electronic Medical Records, and you'll have the content uh, of this talk and uh, interesting links. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much.